We can. And if I'm hoping you can see my screen. I can indeed, Hannah. Yep. Yep. Yay. No problem. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, yes, yeah, thank you for the very kind introduction, Libby, as always. Um, so you can see on the screen now we've got both of our contact details, both Sarah and myself. So do feel free, obviously, to contact either of us and we will <coughs> hopefully uh, be able to help you um, beyond this webinar tonight. So um, before we start, I really wanted to clarify so that we are all on the same page. Uh, what we're talking about when we are speaking of telemedicine. Um, we are, this is telemedicine in the context of remote consulting um, and providing a continuity of service to your clients. So those clients that are under your care. Now we are understandably in the crisis management stage of our current unprecedented situation with COVID-19. However, we really have the opportunity and indeed need to think about what we want to learn from the situation we find ourselves in and actually how we want to work in the future and learn from what we are dealing with at the moment. Remote consulting is, I believe, here to stay. And actually, I think it should be and it can be if we get the basics right. <clears throat> Why do I say this? Well, because we only need to look at our own buying behaviours and activity to see the benefits to your clients. Just think about your own phone and those of your family for a moment. I, for example, have catch up TV services, fitness apps, health apps, pharmacy delivery services, work related apps and online shopping. What do all these apps have in common really to make my life easier, quicker and on demand? This is how we buy and how we behave and our clients are no different. Telemedicine can support these behaviours and, and now is as good a time as any because our consumer behaviours have had to change. One thing this pandemic has taught us as a nation is how to use video conferencing facilities. WhatsApp, FaceTime, Zoom, these have all become the new normal and suddenly it's pretty safe to assume a lot of your clients will now have Zoom on their phone or on their tablet, something that they may not have had just a, a number of weeks ago. I mean, even my mum can join a Zoom call. So if she can do it, certainly a lot of our clients can. And why do we all see that the benefits of video conferencing above a normal phone call at this time? Well, because it's providing us that connection and that support that we need at a much deeper level. We and other health, healthcare providers realise we need a customer centric approach in order to get the best for a client, whether that's a human or an animal patient. This has always been the case, but the COVID-19 pandemic has brought this further into our consciousness. Behaviours that clients consistently rate the most is for their vet practice to be helpful, caring and friendly. By taking the time now to focus on improving our clients' touch points, listening to them, empathising with them and personalising their care, we become more customer centric. And good, effective telemedicine gives you another tool to give clients a further positive experience of your service. To help us with our customer centric approach now and into the future, it helps to stand in our clients shoes and be mindful of all the many limiting factors to being seen in person at the vets at the right time. I'm sure many of you listening can relate to at least some of these statements. We're all busy. And if we think particularly about preventative health care or chronic conditions for that matter, if there isn't a problem staring them in the face to give them a sense of urgency, having a touch point, either virtual or in person, can fall to the bottom of the list. By using telemedicine effectively, we can remove some of these barriers and bring your expertise and services directly to the client in their home. So I'll hand over to Sarah now. Thank Sarah. you very much. Thank you. So we're, we're going to do a little bit of ping ponging between us through this presentation, which uh, hopefully will um, help to, to sort of keep it lively. And the first thing I want to say really is as well is um, following on from Hannah's comment that 
I, I'm a great believer in the value of the remote consultation, having had this experience for some time. Um, and there is so much that I believe we can successfully achieve through this, as I'll hopefully illustrate with some case examples a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so whilst it perhaps has been forced upon us as something we need to absolutely to be doing at the moment, uh, like Hannah, I think this is something that should just be part of our normal uh, clinic appointment diary should include uh, the telephone and or video consultation service to our clients and I think our clients will really appreciate it. From our perspective there are many benefits as listed on here. It allows us of course to keep in contact with our pet owners um, when it comes to chronic conditions, following up dietary change, medication changes. Um, a lot of the information that we need in terms of determining the success of our treatment comes from the history it doesn't necessarily require a hands-on examination of the patient. Um, so we can uh, get, a, get a lot of the, the key information we need um, just by having a discussion with the owner. Um, and there may be other advantages in terms of freeing up time and staff in, in the practice, perhaps allowing us to streamline other services in terms of prescription services, um, also out of hours, triaging and supporting our clients as well. Um, and as has already already mentioned, I've been doing for a number of years now telephone referral consultations with, with clients from around the world and it works very, very well even without a, a video service. There's just a huge amount that you can achieve by having that detailed discussion with the owner. So just some examples, if we move on to the next slide, of course, uh, any of you that do know me as a speaker at all will know that feline medicine is, is my expertise rather than telemedicine. And of course, when it comes to cats, um, there are a huge number of benefits to uh, offering the remote service from the cat's perspective, and also from the owner's perspective. Um, we all know how much cats dislike their routine being interfered with. They don't like to have to skip their breakfast, be put into a cat carrier, transported to the clinic, perhaps wait in a noisy or busy waiting room um, and then be examined by a clinician. All of these things are very stressful to our patient and also therefore stressful to our owners. And there are um, a number of surveys that have, have indicated that the stress that the owner either witnesses or perceives in their cat associated with the clinic visit can actually have a, a real impact on their behaviour. Um, for example, um, owners that do perceive the vet visit to be stressful are much less likely to bring their cat in, in for routine vaccination and preventative healthcare assessment. Things that they might view as non-essential because the cat appears healthy to them, but which of course we as clinicians would view as extremely important appointments. Um, and separately as well, just illustrating the sort of magnitude of the stress issue, um, one fairly recent study of US cat owners, 58% um, of the owners said their cat hated going to the vet. And I do think hate is a, you know, a very, very strong word. So just a huge number of them saying that. And indeed, 38% of these owners said just thinking about taking their cat to the vet was stressful for them. And it might or might not surprise us. Uh, I definitely can relate to it, actually, because uh, our cat is... Um, semi-feral and I have to be you know very deceitful to get him into a cat carrier and into the clinic. It takes me usually a few days of preparation and, and plotting and scheming to achieve um, and our cat owners really feel the same. So avoiding that where it's not needed, thinking beyond the COVID lockdown restrictions, I think is, is a massive advantage for our, our cats, but also for our owners. And um, there is a lot that, of very valuable data that we can still gather. For me as a medicine specialist, the history is always the most important part of the consultation in any case. And that, of course, is unaffected um, by uh, conducting it over the phone or on a, on a video. There's a lot of clinical data that our owners actually can collect for us. Sometimes some training might be needed, but um, a lot of, uh, of uh, information they can relay to us. 
with support and therefore we have a very good chance to be able to make still a very accurate assessment of our patient and determine what uh, treatment plan or management plan is going to be most appropriate and where follow-up um, is needed we can follow up without again that stressful scenario of the visit to the clinic and good examples of where that might be uh, indicated in a, an everyday situation so not COVID situation would be perhaps those cats with a stress associated lower urinary tract disease where we want to know how the cat is doing we want to be in dialogue with the owner but we don't want to force that poor cat that is is stressed and uh, may have um, stress related uh, issues to come into the clinic unless it's needed so lots of advantages for cats and then on the next slide just obviously an important uh, acknowledgement that um, there are many other species that do come to the vet clinic this is sadly our dog who is no longer alive but um, a lovely spot uh, who um, you can see looks a bit sheepish in this photo because he's had a visit to the vet clinic and uh, it wasn't his favourite place to go to either so um, clearly whilst I don't have expertise in species beyond cats um, I would very much acknowledge that many other animals find a visit to the vet clinic stressful and indeed also their, their carers uh, find this a stressful situation for them to have as well. So I'm going to hand back to Hannah at this point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so if we kind of go back a little bit in time, not that long ago, obviously, um, as we said at the beginning, of course, these are extreme times. Never before has the world been shut down due to a, a pandemic. And as we know, one month ago now, on the 23rd of March, we were put into lockdown, which has been extended to at least the beginning of May. Correctly at the time, vet clinics closed for everything other than urgent cases. As a result, there really has had to be a rush by the profession and society to provide remote services. And alongside this, prescribing regulations were relaxed uh, by the Royal College, which is something that uh, will be reviewed up to sort of the, uh, at least until June. Now, of course, we have the revised Royal College BVA and BSAVA guidelines, as well as uh, uh, other species as well, to support decisions to main maintain social distancing while supporting businesses. The updated BVA guidelines state there should be no unnecessary client contact and using technology to triage and consult wherever possible. And so th this is where this obviously webinar has come in to try and give you some practical advice and help and tips. If we think about parasite risks for a moment, Dispensing of parasiticides is a really good example of a core part of veterinary business that we need to consider solutions for during lockdown. And BVA state that, they can, that we can go ahead with parasiticide dispensing uh, if there is an animal health and welfare need and that we can obviously provide uh, that product remotely. Even before coronavirus, our big flea project and our big tick project were carried out and we found that one in four cats and one in seven dogs examined that were coming into the vet practice had fleas, with 11% of those fleas carrying the zoonotic risk uh, bacteria Bartonella. As well as this, one in three dogs had ticks. So these are real risks for our pets that haven't suddenly gone away. And now with the shutdown, dogs are still socialising. Or even if the advice is to keep them on the lead, there are still many occasions when they are actually making contact with each other and being exposed to parasite risks that are out there, such as ticks um, and, uh, um, and worms. Cats are still going outside and pets and people are in close confinement probably more than ever before in the home. We can't ignore the fact that even though it may be difficult for some practices at this time, we're missing an opportunity if we don't educate our clients of the importance of effective control and provide a solution in a safe way so that people can maintain social distancing. Remote consultations and remote prescribing and delivery to pets under our care can allow this to happen with minimal fuss. So some practical considerations that we've been learning over the last month um, and obviously from Sarah's experience and from having carried out remote consultations for many years. Um, we have um, potentially been thrown into these remote consultations, um, but things that certainly need to be addressed are 
First and foremost, I think the take home message is to keep things as simple as possible. But we do need a system that allows you to book appropriate length consultation time slots with minimal fuss, making it easy for the client to actually get on and speak to you. The ability to charge the client for the consultation beforehand. Get actually giving the owner the option of being seen or not. And some clients want to be seen by video conference, but if you have the ability to turn that off and just utilize the phone system on your platform, then that's a really nice uh, option for your clients. Timetable the next call or that next point of contact if it isn't actually a follow up call before the end of the consultation so that you've got a treatment plan in place. And another tip, something that both myself and Sarah are doing even this evening, is having a hands-free phone with a headset. It aids note taking, it helps you kind of keep um, uh, outside noise to a minimum and it helps you um, concentrate on what is going on ahead of you. So like I say, obviously a video call might not always be needed or wanted, but if you think back to the beginning, now more than ever, that feeling of connection and support is vitally important to us as people. We need our clients to work with us to get the best for their pets. And research shows that a familiar face, eye contact and body language all has a huge part to play when it comes to getting your message across, empathising with your clients and getting buy-in to a treatment plan. Now, this evening's webinar is more about the clinical side and those practical aspects of what you can do in a remote telephone uh, consultation. But we will be covering tips on how to um, do an effective consultation through behaviour and management uh, in more detail in a later webinar in this series. Video calls have a real place in your practice to build empathy. And it's not just for those bad news consults, but it should be considered for clinical problems and diagnosis and also preventative healthcare. It can also be a really effective way of increasing client touch points, such as post-op checks chronic condition management and your nurse clinics. So what tools can you use? What's available? Well, there certainly seems to be a plethora of options out there and it can be a bit of a minefield that can be quite overwhelming. Some are obviously easier, to, uh, easier than others to use, such as WhatsApp, FaceTime and Skype, but they can be missing some of that functionality that the video conferencing platforms allow you. Remember, asking an owner if they have Zoom is not actually that strange anymore. People are using it for that, uh, that contact with their own families. Now here at MSD, we have listened to the feedback and to what uh, you as our customers are saying out there um, on a day-to-day -day basis when you're starting to kind of um, use video conferencing on a regular basis. And um, as I say, we've listened to it and from the end of next week, we will be launching a service to provide video conferencing to your clients. The takeaway message of this, of this facility is that it is as simple as, it can as we can possibly make it. The in interface is bespoke to your practice, as I've sort of shown you here on this screenshot. The appointments are simple to set up and based on what works for you and your clients. And then it's also very simple for you to book and pay for those consultations before they happen. Then the client, client is automatically sent a link to their personal meeting with you, so they can't join that meeting before you start it. It is a Zoom based platform, which, as I say, many clients will now be uh, very familiar with. And the idea underpinning that service is to make it as easy as possible for you and the client. Now, if you want to learn more, like I say, it will be launching from the end of next week, then please do log your interest in the question box and your MSD account manager can follow up with you directly. I guess now it's a good time to review your setup for running an effective video call, off, which is often from home. As already said, that hands-free headset is a great investment to improve sound quality, minimise background noise and distractions. The real benefit of the video is the ability to make eye contact with your clients. So using a laptop riser um, will allow you to actually get the camera at the correct height. 
And if you don't have access to a laptop riser, you can buy them uh, very easily on Amazon and the likes. Actually, just a decent sized box will do the same work. If you have your own picture on the screen, depending on the platform that you're using, and you can, I always advise that you actually move that to just below the camera. There is a sort of a tendency for, to, for you to keep glancing at your own image on the screen. And if you move it up to below the camera, it's actually in the right place. So it'll encourage you to keep looking in the right direction to maintain eye contact with your client. Good lighting is also key. Try not to sit in front of a window. If you do have a light source, keep it behind the computer facing you or at least off to one side, and that will improve uh, the lighting and the ability for the client to see your face as you're talking to them. Also think about what's behind you. You kind of want to look uh, professional but friendly. So either have a very sort of plain background, otherwise people will be distracted and trying to look at what's going on behind you, or it may even be possible to have something bespoke in the background, such as a practice logo. And finally, the other, um, tip that we would give you is to close other applications on your computer. So email other um, web-based uh, um, links that you're not needing. It helps prevent distractions and it actually can also improve your connectivity. So Sarah. Thank you very much. So next is really looking at what information um, can a client provide and if you could just to advance the, I think there's three bullet points on this slide that oh. will appear, Hannah, if uh, just bring them all up, that's fine. Um, so the standard history that you would always want to collect is, is obviously the starting point and uh, I have a questionnaire which I've developed, particularly thinking of older cats, um, but that you, uh, I'll show you in a moment, which might be a good starting point just to remind you uh, of what questions questions that you need to, to ask if you're feeling slightly daunted by particularly being on video rather than a, a standard face-to-face -face consultation. But uh, essentially the first part is, is really very much what you would normally be doing in your consulting room anyway. But then the next thing really is to consider how can a client um, potentially provide clinically relevant information to you? And in actual fact, there are, I think, quite a lot of things that a client can help with. Um, some examples listed on here, definitely not uh, a comprehensive list, um, but depending on the patient um, presenting complaints, the particular concerns that you or your client may have, it may be helpful to ask them to, for example, uh, count a respiratory rate or feel a heart rate uh, or look at skin tenting, for example. And of course, it may be that through the consultation, you need to explain exactly how to do that and maybe send them away and ask them to, to send in information, perhaps especially if, uh, if maybe you've got a dog that's sort of bouncing around, it's hard to, to measure their resting heart rate or respiratory rate whilst you're talking to them. Um, but essentially there is a lot of clinically relevant data which an owner can collect, um, even in an animal that doesn't have visible lesions as it were. And in fact, uh, I've uh, started um, just in the last month with, with COVID to do some free owner uh, Zoom webinars through my website, Vet Professionals. And we're recording these and, and putting them on the video tutorial page of the website. And I'll show you a screenshot of that at the end. But last week's session, uh, which was slightly, I would say, incorrectly named Nursing Sick Cats at Home, um, had a huge focus really on what clinical data owners can can collect from their cat at home and therefore help their vets when they talk to them to really understand well what might be the nature of the problem. So um, if you're looking for resources which your clients might find helpful, um, that might be one of them because it shows, for example, little videos of respiratory rates, skin tenting videos, um, and so on and so forth. It explains how to measure water consumption how to monitor urination, defecation, etc. Um, so collecting all this information and, and perhaps from more complex cases, especially um, some advanced notification of what you might be interested in may be possible as well. In addition to obviously those examples where perhaps there is a lesion that the owner has spotted either uh, a lump or a scab or something they're not happy with, um, they potentially they can also take some images of that themselves to send into you because 
any of you that have done a video consultation will know that, of course, via the video, it really is not the same as standing in that consulting room with your client. It can be quite hard, uh, firstly, for the client um, who typically is using their phone to, to get the video footage um, of the animal. It can be quite hard to get the lighting right, to be able to see a lesion properly and actually make any sort of judgment. So if the owner separately um, is able to take photographs or perhaps video footage of, of any lesions or abnormal behaviour, that just gives you a better opportunity to study it and, and make uh, hopefully a more accurate decision. And in terms of sharing large file sizes, uh, I tend to use WhatsApp with my clients uh, or a Dropbox. I have a, a, a personal Dropbox, but you can potentially obviously set up one for your practice for that purposes to hopefully make it easier to collect that sort of data um, from, from your patients. If we move on to the next slide, you can see some other examples. So um, weighing pets at home. Well, um, many of our, our clients probably don't have cat sized scales available to them, but you can fairly inexpensively get hold of these. So for cats that have uh, and small dogs, uh, these weigh up to 20 kilos and they're designed for babies, but obviously very useful for small pets as well. Um, these can be a really useful investment for any patients with chronic chronic health conditions um, where monitoring at home is likely to be helpful and you can get them typically from, from uh, stores like Amazon for maybe 30 or 40 pounds. So if an owner has either one animal that they absolutely adore and has a chronic health condition or several animals that they would like to monitor, it's really not um, a ridiculously huge purchase for them to potentially consider in any case, but obviously at the moment perhaps even more helpful. Of course, you can still get weight measurements of, of some sort by uh, using your own um, bathroom scales. So, you know, standing on, uh, weighing yourself and then weighing yourself with your pet. Um, but that tends to be just a little bit more awkward. Food and water consumption, so asking owners to, to record a diary of what they're offering in terms of amount of water uh, per 24 hour period and what has been drunk can be extremely helpful for diagnosis and monitoring of a number of conditions, but of of particular note for me would always be uh, diabetes mellitus, where uh, we're looking for a good response to insulin, often to be reflected in a reduction in polydipsia. Um, but of course, for any patients we're worried about having a poor appetite, actually monitoring food consumption, if it's possible, if there's only one animal in the household, so we can actually weigh and monitor it, can really be very helpful as well in terms of really telling us more accurately what is the, the magnitude of this problem, how worried do I need to be? Activity trackers are, are becoming um, more and more popular, probably more for dogs than cats currently, um, and uh, I think could play a really helpful role in monitoring patients, uh, whether it's related to mobility issues or perhaps weight issues and wanting to increase their activity. So that may give you some more um, uh, areas of, of clinical um, information that you can monitor. And again, any abnormal behaviour or uh, if you want to demonstrate mobility, uh, having a video is a really useful way of doing that. Um, and last but not least, we're all very familiar with asking our clients to collect samples from, from their patients. Um, and there are a, a number of, of samples that owners uh, can be really very good at, at collecting, whether it's blood glucose, again, in diabetic patients, or urine samples at home from cats and dogs, feces samples, of course, and, and potentially other options beyond that. I mean, even potentially a, if you had a, a, an unpleasant wound that uh, perhaps you're worried about your immunosuppressed patient wanting to get a really good bacteriology swab from it, you know, that could be something an owner could do at home as well. So there are all sorts of options um, for you to consider. If we move on to the next slide, um, this is the first part of the questionnaire that I mentioned a few moments ago. So this is um, free to download. Um, if you go to vetprofessionals.com, um, the top menu is helpful info and then look for free downloads. Um, there, this includes um, a, a, a lot of articles and technical guides, some aimed at veterinary professionals, some aimed at cat owners. Um, you do have to register to access the documents, but there's there's no charge and we are GDPR compliant. We will not 
send you any communications you don't want to know about, but we do just like to see what are the popular downloads, hence asking for that registration. And uh, this is a health questionnaire and checklist orientated for senior cats, but just may be useful for anyone who is feeling like they need a little bit of a prompt to remind them what questions so they, they're not forgetting anything. This is the general health section. And then on the next slide, um, there's actually um, a mobility questions, which are particularly helpful for the older cat where osteoarthritis is a potential um, and also may pick up some behavioural changes related to cognitive dysfunction. So cats uh, having uh, altered behaviour with their housemates and people in the home, perhaps uh, altered sleep patterns and so forth, uh, may be picked up through this questionnaire as well. So that may be something that uh, is of interest to you. And then uh, finally, just a few examples to illustrate how um, telemedicine can be useful. This is the first patient. This is Sula, who I think I, I have seen Sula in, in real life a couple of times. Um, but as a referral patient, she's primarily managed um, by um, her, um, her general practice. And uh, but I have maintained contact with her for the last year um, through email and phone calls. And uh, she had a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease where the, the main complaint or main concern from her owner's perspective was often that she had a poor appetite and that she'd, be, she'd been losing weight at the time I first became involved in her care. And when I suggested uh, keeping a diary of what they were offering Sula and what she was eating, as you can see, um, her owners really took this to heart. I did not give them this table to fill in. They designed this table completely themselves. Um, and as you can see, it records uh, how much food is being fed, whether it's wet or dry, um, the per percentage of food that is uh, a renal diet um, is recorded and also Sula's weight, um, the date and whether her weight is going up or down. Um, so really detailed information. And on the basis of, um, partly on the basis of of, of this information relayed to me through email and phone calls, we have adjusted um, how we've approached her dietary uh, management and also used appetite stimulants and, and other supportive care uh, related to her CKD. And it's reduced the number of vet visits that she's needed, which is, uh, I think, a great advantage of that telemedicine approach. On the next slide, um, we've got uh, another example of, uh, this is actually a refer telephone referral patient of mine called Shai, who I've I've never had the pleasure of meeting in person, um, but have been um, involved in Shai's care on and off for a number of years now. And poor Shai's had uh, problems with lower urinary tract disease. And as part of his monitoring, um, this was his owner's idea actually, but it's one that I, I'm now using and recommending to others. Um, was she got a, a webcam, which has been rechristened the WeCam, um, which allowed her to see exactly what was happening when Shai uses the litter tray. And this particular setup, um, she can activate it to, to record when she hears that Shai has gone into the tray and then collects uh, videos, which she sends to me. And uh, at times when Shai is struggling, you can see very clearly uh, the dysuria and the discomfort uh, exhibited um, and also the size of the urine ball that he's producing, which is really helpful in understanding, of course, uh, for any cat with urinary tract disease, firstly, that there uh, is an ability to, to pass urine so that he's not blocked, uh, but also gives us a lot of valuable information in terms of um, how his lower urinary tract disease is doing with the, the various modifications that, that we've been using to support him. And then on the, the next slide, we have another urinary case, uh, beautiful Milo. Uh, Milo's a ragdoll cat, and um, any of you that, that see ragdolls will know that one of the conditions that they sadly seem to be quite vulnerable to is oxalate urolithiasis. And poor Milo, even at the age of 10 months, um, was passing very bloody urine. Um, both of those photos of, of urine samples were owner-collected. 
um, and uh, Milo is an indoor only cat. His owner um, had spotted this at home and uh, Milo actually very obligingly will pee in an empty litter tray. So whenever a sample is needed, it's really easy to collect. And uh, as part of his uh, monitoring, um, post uh, treatment of his oxalate urolithiasis, um, he, we managed to, to flush or with the help of the, the Dick Vet School flush uh, the, some stones down to his, his bladder and and uh, sort the problem but he's remained vulnerable to recurrent problems and monitoring therefore his urine at home in terms of hematuria uh, both through grossly observing it and dipstick tests and also um, many of you will probably be aware now there is this Royal Canin product uh, Blue Care Litter which is very sensitive in uh, turning blue, a very visible blue, as you can see in that top right picture, when even very small amounts of blood are present in the urine um, and therefore alerting you to recurrence of a problem. So all of this information can be collected with him at home. It's allowing us to, to really fine tune the monitoring and make sure that we're really on the case in terms of, of his lower urinary tract disease. And uh, I think now I'll hand back to Hannah for a, a little bit of diabetes discussion. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so yes, uh, we mentioned briefly um, before um, diabetes and the ability to obviously keep a, keep a track and get owners to monitor um, this condition very effectively at home. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to remind you of some of the tools and services that we have to support uh, the practice with our Caninsulin product range. Um, as a result, um, like I say, all these tools are really focused on actually home monitoring. We have a pet diabetes tracker app that you can see up in the left hand corner here, where the client can monitor food, as Sarah was saying earlier. They can monitor the water intake, which is such a key part of giving us some indicators uh, of whether the diabetes is being effectively controlled. We can also monitor exercise and weight, as well as actually creating charts and glucose curves. And those charts can then be actually emailed directly to you or attached to the appointment booking to aid your discussion, whether that's in the clinic or over that video consultation. We also have diabetic diaries and other support tools, such as uh, when they're first diagnosed, so uh, the ability to actually watch and read things to help them with the administration of the caninsulin. We always have a lot of requests for CPD relating to diabetes management. And so I'd like to just flag to you that to please keep a lookout for a new webinar that we will be running in May with a group of key opinion leaders where we will be doing further tips and guidance to support you in managing diabetes remotely. So that's both obviously for now during the COVID uh, pandemic but also in the future and to give you tips and tricks to help manage uh, diabetes effectively. Sarah. Thank you. And just uh, keeping with the theme of diabetes, this was uh, just a final example of one of my patients where home monitoring was very effective. Um, this is Toots, a 13 year old female neutered domestic short hair diagnosed with diabetes mellitus and her um, elderly owner in the, in the background of that photograph on the left hand side. And uh, when Toots' diabetes was, was first diagnosed and we were uh, discussing the management and insulin and, and uh, explaining how monitoring water consumption and other parameters was really useful in giving us information on um, stabilization of the diabetes. Um, Toots's owner really took that to heart as you can see. So very low tech in this example, um, but on his notebook he started to record um, actually a 12 hourly water consumption. So it's it's you need to look at two lines to get the 24 hour water consumption. And what you can see is on the left hand picture that uh, the 24 hour water consumption started off at uh, around about 400 mils per day, a lot of water for a, a cat to drink. Um, but as we move to the right hand sheet, you can see uh, certainly lower down the sheet that it's now dropped to more like 120 mils per day. So really clear, um, huge response. In fact, Toots did have some kidney disease, so that probably uh, thirst was always going to remain a little bit higher than perhaps normal. 
And it was really useful, uh, firstly, for her owner to see this clear impact of um, the, the diabetic uh, stabilisation having such a positive uh, or being reflected so positively in the water consumption. But it also meant that when there were any future hiccups, um, Toots's owner was absolutely on the case uh, fairly instantaneously, as you might imagine. Um, so when Toots did have uh, a couple of urinary tract infections that destabilised the diabetes, we were able to see that very, very quickly. And uh, were that to be today during the COVID scenario, this would be a situation where potentially with our support, uh, Toots's owner could collect a urine sample at home. And uh, again, with our support, hopefully facilitate that getting to a laboratory for uh, appropriate assessment so that uh, the correct antibiotics could be prescribed if need be. So really valuable uh, or a good example, I think, of where the, the client information is really valuable. Um, in the management of the condition. And if we move on just um, really very briefly, because I think you'll be uh, really aware of, of um, the guidelines that are coming out through the Royal College, just a, a reminder of, of, of where we are today and uh, importantly that if you are listening to this webinar, um, not tonight, uh, as in if, if you're listening to it um, after the event, that the guidelines may well have changed. So we're, we're all keeping an eye out on the uh, Royal College website in terms of any updates. Um, but the, the thrust of the, the current recommendations and guidelines is, of course, very much with the intention of protecting human health and safety as our, our first objective by um, reducing contact with clients as much as we possibly can, uh, whilst still, of course, supporting animal welfare and health care. Um, and so deciding um, whether we can see patients according to their, their clinical need. Um, and indeed, if we look at the next slide, um, following the, the Royal College guidelines in terms of being able to make some prescriptions via our telemedicine consultations that in normal times might not have been um, allowed so freely. So this understanding really that in order for us to be able to provide um, healthcare to our, our patients, um, the rules have been relaxed to allow us to make some prescriptions um, over the phone if we feel um, clinically that we can justify our treatment decision that, uh, for example, we've seen on a video consultation that a cat has what appears to be a bite wound and it's a bit pussy and the cat's off colour and, and it looks therefore like the cat has, a, has an abscess, for example. And uh, there is a, a flow chart which you won't be able to read, um, but you may well have seen, which gives, uh, again, some guidelines really as to how to try and make decisions in these difficult times, with the emphasis being really on using where possible telemedicine to um, support you in terms of uh, repeat prescriptions or treatment modifications and also treatment of new uh, minor illnesses that you feel uh, able to make um, a presumptive diagnosis over the phone and you know that are likely to have an impact on animal welfare such as the, the examples on the slide um, and that if you do have to see the patient of course you you take uh, all possible precautions to minimize uh, contact with with the client and to protect your staff as well so I know you will all be you know very much familiar with this through having to work through this at the moment. Um, and at this point, I think this is uh, time to hand back to Hannah for a, a bit more information about another MSD initiative, which hopefully will help to support you in your remote prescribing. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so just wanted to finish up this evening on the home delivery side, because how to get medicines and parasiticides to your clients and how this service is signposted is an important consideration for the customer experience if we think back to people's buying behaviours that we covered at the beginning of the webinar. There's no point, for example, in sending out a standard parasite reminder to your clients at the moment if you don't have a plan in place for them to obtain their treatments. If there's not clear direction and support to act on the reminder, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, you only risk antagonising the client base and wasting staff's time and resource. Of course, of course, you have different options to get medicines to your owners, from picking up from the practice while maintaining social distancing, to dropping off treatments and home delivery. Home delivery is a way of life and it's fast becoming the norm. Even before COVID-19, 
UK adults spent on average £56 a month on subscription services and 29% of shoppers were subscribing to a delivery service. Now, I'm sure we can all imagine that that has uh, grown a lot over the last month or so. But home delivery will remain a way of life and we need to challenge ourselves to make healthcare accessible for our patients. Parasiticides is such a large and rapidly evolving market and there are so many options available to obtaining treatments outside of the vet channel that we need to be competing. The solution that we provide at MSD is Vets Deliver, where the parasiticides are delivered directly to the client's door in a nicely branded quality box to reflect the service that you are providing to your clients. So for those of you that don't know about Vets Deliver, Vets Deliver, with Vets Deliver, the vet examines and prescribes Prevecto alongside a wormer of your choice, whether that is a monthly wormer or a uh, wormer that you are providing on a quarterly basis. Both can be included within the Vets Deliver box. Direct debits are set up on a monthly basis and text reminders can be sent. And then, of course, prescriptions are revalidated by the clinic every six months. We have now launched an online sign up service for you where you can share a link with your client to whom you have prescribed. So that whole process can now be remote from the video consultation through to delivery to the owner. So you can provide the solution where parasiticides are due directly to their door, maintaining that cash flow into the practice, maintaining parasite control for the pet, and actually also that positive customer experience for, for your client. So if you have any questions about Vets Deliver or particularly around the new online sign up, then again, please do speak to your MSD account manager and they can talk you through the whole process in more detail. So Sarah, I'll hand back to you now to summarise the uh, webinar's key points. Thank you. So I think that the key points from both of us are that uh, we certainly believe that phone and or video consultations can and should be a really um, important ongoing um, part of practice life for us all because they can be so helpful and I think helpful not only in, in triage and diagnosis but also in monitoring and supporting our clients for example those new medications, new diets, ironing out teething problems that might be happening often it's it's a conversation that that does that we can of course use them as well for sharing test results and we do this a lot of this as a norm anyway um, but I think building it in as a, as a proper part of our appointment diary I think is really justified and I don't think you should be afraid to, to charge for it um, and I, that's obviously a discussion for you to have in your clinics as to how you charge for a phone consultations whether you charge the same as a standard consultation which I think is certainly justifiable or whether you feel you should not charge the same because you're not examining the patient well that is a decision for you um, but I think for many pets and also for many owners really given the choice again even excluding the COVID situation um, they would probably prefer the, the remote consultation for many situations clearly it doesn't substitute that opportunity to examine the pet and there are a number of situations where it you really it can be a bit frustrating because if there is a lump for example that the client has felt and you can't feel a lump through through a phone or through a video um, but don't forget that there are just a huge number of situations where that phone consultation really can provide you with all of the key information that you need to make the really good clinical decisions for that patient and have really good discussions with the owners and I think that it, it will be valued um, and that last take-home message is always really to make sure that you do have a plan with the client that you agree at the end as to when you're next going to be in touch and how that's going to happen whether you are going to book that next appointment now or whether you're going to plan to email them however it's going to work get that in the diary um, and if we just move move on to the final side this is just an acknowledgement slide where I wanted to show 
a screenshot of my website. This is uh, vetprofessionals.com and we've got two new banners. That red banner is um, some uh, webinars I did for cat owners through Zoom which uh, discussed uh, COVID-19 and its significance to cat owners when there was a little flurry of papers that came out reporting infection in uh, cats and concern over transmission of COVID. Um, so that's something that was presented in there and, and discussed with cat owners as well as how to, to manage uh, the perhaps reduced access to veterinary services from an owner perspective. Um, and then ongoing, we've uh, the green banner is, is this cat cafe I've spoken about where uh, we've now moved on to other topics and uh, once a week four o'clock on a Thursday I have a, a live Zoom which owners can can join in and uh, give about a 20 or 30 minutes webinar this week we're talking about kidney disease and how to recognize it and then having an informal Q&A so if you do think that will be of interest to any of your cat owners who are perhaps worrying in lockdown about their cats then uh, they can access recordings of previous sessions uh, through that uh, um, the banners on the website um, and they can also sign up to new events and and hopefully there will be some information there that can provide some reassurance and also as mentioned earlier on if if you uh, think it'd be helpful to tutor any of your cats through clinical exam tips uh, then the last week Cat Cafe uh, did uh, discuss that so feel free to use that resource um, as well. So I think I've prob probably said enough at this point so I'll, I'll um, be very happy and I know Hannah will also be very happy to um, take any questions or hear if anyone has um, some top tips they're happy to share um, as well. I'll, I'll be really delighted to hear those as well. Thank you. Yes, thanks thank Sarah yeah. and um, I'll just reiterate that um, from, from what we were saying earlier that um, as well as any questions that you have at the moment, if you do need any further information, uh, any su further support from MSD, then please be uh, either drop a note in the comment box or speak to your MSD account manager, especially relating to the online video platform Vets Deliver or um, our upcoming CPD. So I'll hand back to Libby. Lovely. Thanks so much, Hannah. And thank you so much, Sarah. That was that was just brilliant. I think it's given us some really great insight into the world of telemedicine and um, just how much that you can do to support your clients, you know, and your patients, you know, virtually in that way. Um, I love the um, the records that were being kept by the clients. To me, that kind of showed just what great engagement you can get and what great compliance, even with like a, a remote delivery of care. And is that is that something that you find very commonly, Sarah, that they are just as engaged? In this yeah, way. I, I think so. I mean, I, I think obviously this, my my core clients are referral clients, so yeah. clearly they're self-selected as as particularly interested. But um, it never fails to surprise me actually that when I make, you know, I talk to them and say things like mon monitoring weight is really helpful and perhaps if you can, I'll send them some links, you know, invest in this sort of scales and weigh your mm -hmm. cat and you can send me the data. They really just, you know, they, they do it and, and then you get Excel spreadsheets and you get, you know, graphs and um, real engagement. And I think it, it does for chronic health conditions in particular. Um, I think it takes a lot of the worry away from the client if they feel that they're really actively involved and they understand the condition and they can have sensible discussions with you and you're all working together as a team and it just it becomes a much more rewarding uh, situation all around and uh, much I think yes I say more reassuring for them to feel that they're playing a part in that. Mm, yes, yes great great engagement and do you find Sarah regarding the length of your consultations? Is it very variable? And um, and I guess, again, because they're referral consultations, they are going to be that little bit longer. But, but do you have any kind of um, guidance on what's achievable within a, a video consultation or a telephone consultation? So I would say for my telephone referrals, they are an hour. So that is obviously quite a long one. And um, but I think the, another key message really for the video consult would be to not put too much pressure on yourselves to for the video aspect of it to be clinically useful, um, if that makes sense, because 
it, as I was mentioning, it's you can't, you're not standing in the same room as the patient. You're not able to touch it, listen to its chest, palpate its abdomen, all those key things. So I, my uh, approach really is to focus on what information I can get from the owner. So really that history plus, 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 and uh, training the owner to collect other key data. For example, if they've reported breathing difficulties, what might be helpful uh, in, a not, uh, in a patient that's obviously not critical, where you, you don't need to see it urgently, but let's say the owner says, oh, the breathing, they're wheezing or they're snoring or whatever it might be, is to actually uh, ask them to try and, you know, listen, is it breathing in? Is it breathing out? is it both is breathing labored you know all the sorts of things we are taught at vet school try and see how much an owner is able to answer those and and obviously collecting videos and use them really as a conduit for that information um, so it's it's optimizing them as, as a sort of collection information collection device I think rather than relying on the video aspect of the consult for you to be able to interpret too much from the patient because I think that can be very very challenging to organize um, my my sense would be in terms of timing that probably you want to allow a little bit more time than you would do uh, at least initially for your uh, video consultations because anything new tends to take a little bit longer and mm -hmm. there may be also the odd little technical glitch in terms of getting both of you onto whatever platform you're using, if that's the case. So I would say probably try and allow a little bit more time flexibility if you can. Lovely. OK, that's great. Thank you, Sarah. And obviously, I think, you know, because of this remoteness or whatever, consultate or communication skills really have to play a key role to, you know, the body language. Maybe if you're not, you know, on the video body language uh, via the telephone and even sometimes on video can be hard to read. Um, so it's kind of thinking about kind of, I guess, how, what kind of questions that you use um, to your clients using open questions and whatever as well. Do you find that that, uh, communication skills are important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was interested that uh, I don't know if Hannah can say any more about the forthcoming uh, webinar that seems like that will look at this. But I, I think, um, again, some comments that also Hannah made it, when I'm doing a consultation, I am definitely wanting to take notes, as probably many people will be wanting to do and needing to do. Um, so actually, in terms of the history taking, um, I, I would say, given a preference, I might prefer the video off for that bit so that uh, I can just concentrate on asking the questions, listening to the answers and writing my responses. Um, but I appreciate perhaps, you know, the, the client may not prefer that at, at the moment. Um, but in which case, if certainly when I'm doing these consultations via Skype, I will, I will absolutely say to someone, I'm going to take notes, so I, I can't, I'm afraid I, I will look like I'm ignoring you. I'm just looking at my notepad and writing things down. That's mm -hmm. why. Um, but you obviously you can't sort of sit and stare into your webcam uh, and take notes simultaneously. Yeah. But there yeah. are those those things. But uh, I don't know if Hannah, you've got any more comments on that forthcoming webinar you alluded to. Um, yeah, so um, it, just to follow up from what you were saying, Sarah, absolutely, I think. Um, just advising you know explaining to the the owner obviously you can't keep eye contact at all times but one of the key points obviously for the video call is to have that empathy and to have that sort of connection with them so if you are going to be making notes I think just explaining it like you do is perfectly kind of reasonable and acceptable and actually we know that even in meetings that if you make notes it actually is really appreciated by the other person they realize that you're listening to them so it, it's in exactly the same way to the client it can actually be a reassurance to them that you are kind of acknowledging and properly listening and engaging with them when it comes to the forthcoming webinar yes the details will be coming out very soon um, we those will be um, recorded webinars um, so that you can listen to them on demand um, and they will be focusing on um, couple of aspects one around the financials and the reasoning behind you know continuing with telemedicine in the future 
but also, as you say, the sort of more behavioural aspects and the way to do effective uh, communication and effective um, recommendation to clients through that remote system. And there actually will be tips, obviously, you can utilise within uh, the real life setting when they're in the consulting room with you, but also to take away and uh, and utilise through the telemedicine platform as well. So just get, so keep your eyes open, and we will send out um, uh, communication to our to to our customer base um, as soon as we've got those kind of uh, recorded and ready to go. But they will should be within the next couple of weeks. Lovely, Hannah, that sounds terrific. Um, so lots of um, requests coming in about the remote platform, about accessing it. Um, you'll be pleased to hear. So so don't forget, everybody, that if you would like to hear from your MSD um, territory manager about that, do please pop your details into the question box and they'll be in touch with you. Hannah, just one question about it. Is the, is the platform free? It looks terrific. Is it free to MSD customers? Um, the financial side of it will sort of we can take you through on a on a um, um, individual basis. It uh, it will be uh, very much supported by MSD. It just uh, whether it's going to be completely free is still to be uh, you know 100% finalised. But we can discuss it with you. It will certainly be you know very competitive uh, with uh, all other services that are out there currently. OK, thank you. Just a couple of people were asking that. Um, very interested in exploring a little bit more around kind of the existing uh, relationship that you referred to there, Sarah. Some people are asking about, you know, so does this, can we only see clients? What about new clients? And I know that this is a matter of quite a lot of debate, particularly in the US around the veterinary patient client relationship um, being there before you can conduct any sort of telemedicine consults. Do you know, do you, um, what do you feel about that? What's the the current guidance? Do you do you know beyond? Well, I'm not sure. I do know. To be perfectly honest, I think that's a, a brilliant question. Um, I I mean the patients that I see um, are all referrals when it's telemedicine, so that's not mm -hmm. um, it's not an issue I've I've had to face. Um, but I do think it's a yeah it's a really important question and I, I don't know whether there is any guidance on the, the Royal College website about you know new clients um, because clearly obviously from a cl clinical perspective if you know that owner and you've seen that cat particularly if you've seen it within in the last six months you know it does give you a lot of reassurance that you know the animal which you're talking about and therefore comfortable uh, in terms of understanding its its current health requirements as best as is possible in the current climate whereas of course if there's you know a new patient and and you've never ever laid hands on it um, that that is quite difficult so I, I sadly I can't answer that question I don't know whether Hannah has any uh, insight at all to add? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I will. I will add. I know that obviously. So even before COVID, there were obviously remote um, veterinary support and consultations that were happening. Um, if you look at some of the insurance companies, for example, they provide um, as an added um, benefit to uh, people that have their insurance a uh, almost like a triage type service with. Uh, remote consultations and veterinary consultations. The difference that has happened obviously recently, now this may be a temporary change due to COVID, is the Royal College relaxing um, the prescribing rules. So there are some services out there now that have popped up whereby uh, vets are um, carrying out consultations remotely and they wouldn't be deemed kind of under their care as in under the, the care of a local practice in that um, traditional sense but due to the relaxing of the RCVS guidelines recently uh, for COVID then they can prescribe um, medications now they have to still be obviously for the welfare of the animal and you'd have to be um, with your professional um, clinical decision making process that what you're doing is um, 
is okay for the animal's welfare um, and you'd obviously have to maintain very good clinical notes to support that. However, we don't know that those regulations will remain longer term um, mm -hmm. and they may change post COVID. But also I think, like I said at the very beginning, um, when I think about telemedicine um, and remote video consulting and the longevity of it, the benefit and the longevity of the service, I believe, remains very strongly with uh, clients under your care currently. So your current uh, client data database, that's where the benefit really lies with the loyalty, with the empathy, with the touch points to improve your customer service. So although it is happening at the moment, whether there is any ability for these companies that have popped up to persist longer term it really comes down to the Royal College's uh, continued review of the remote prescribing regulations. Yes and that's that's um, still ongoing isn't it so the under my yes. care kind of consultations taking place first and I'm sure they'll come back to the telemedicine again after that so um, it might get pushed up the agenda as well uh, more quickly too. Um, a question probably to both of you and um, some questions coming in around posting medications and posting flea and worm treatments and stuff is that is that legal is it allowable you know through the mail what's what's your advice? Um, yes, it is legal. Um, now, obviously, it does depend on the classification of the medication that you're posting. Uh, Royal Mail does have actually a link um, and guide, clear guidance on what you can and cannot post through th their system. And I think if I'm right, actually, in the Royal College's uh, website at the moment under the COVID-19 guidance, so in their FAQ document, there is a direct link to that Royal Mail guidance. So it's very easy to find. Um, and certainly your parasiticides, for example, um, it is perfectly legal to post those out through the Royal Mail service. Uh, Sarah, yeah. I don't know if you've got anything no, no nothing to add. Yes, I think I spotted that guidance as well on the Royal College website that you, you mentioned. I definitely remember seeing something about the Royal Mail in there. So um, I think that's a good place to look. Lovely, thank you. Um, really uh, interesting and, and relevant question here. Um, so what is your advice regarding making the transition from free phone discussions which so many of us have in practice you know you're chatting about results or you're you're having a chat with them on the phone you know about um about their cat or whatever going from free discussions to charged phone consultations without kind of upsetting those loyal clients that you might be speaking to quite often any tips i think yeah it's a, it's it obviously is a great question and I think as a profession we're I think naturally so generous and so you know kind-hearted we're all in this because we we just really want to do the best we can for our clients and our patients and that doesn't always make us the best business people um, but I think uh, my attitude would be that, um, that you know we are in a, a good position at the moment to really launch this uh, as a as a going concern as a going practice uh, and therefore when people ring up the, the first person that typically will answer the phone in the vet clinic is is going to be the receptionist now um, and or that you know is the standard situation and that this is something that I think should be offered would you like um, a a telephone appointment we're we're not offering face-to-face -face appointments of course in view of covid but we are offering telephone consultations and as per our standard consultation um, this this is charged as, as i mentioned earlier on it's obviously up to you as a clinic to to make a decision as to how you feel is right to manage that with your clients um, but from my perspective as also as a pet owner i think when you have anxiety about your your pets and you have a genuine 
health concern, um, you're just going to be delighted that there is actually a service there for you because probably your, your fear contacting the vet clinic might be that actually there isn't a service there because um, there's so much anxiety at the, at the moment with everything. So I think if someone says to you, yes, of course, we really sorry to hear, yes, your cat's been sick this morning. And of course, you'd like to speak to a clinician and we can offer you this time and we have a fee for our, our telephone consultation because it is, you know, a proper consultation with the vet. And um, and I think just, you know, I would say go for it on those lines. Um, I don't know whether that anyone listening has other tips that they would like to share, but I, I think for many of the reasons that we've mentioned tonight, actually, that um, if, if you are offering, you know, a, a proper consultation, which is what we're talking about there is no reason why that should not be a proper paid for service and i think that any clients that uh, experience that let's say 15 minutes detailed discussion of, of their pet are not going to feel that um you know that uh, being charged is inappropriate Yes, uh, great advice there, Sarah. And someone's responded to your your call for any tips Thank you. or whatever, and um, and said so develop the lines to you. So presumably, you know, writing a script and deliver deliver it with confidence. Um, he's saying ums and errs places doubts in the cu customer's mind. So you it gives them wriggle room then to question it. So if you're confident and you're kind of literally, you know exactly what you're saying, that will that will help. Yes, yeah, sounds good. And I think this is also where you can you can catch it in terms of we've launched a new service to respond to the current situation we're in. And this might be a situation where being although we've said keep it simple um, is, you know, is often a key message. Um, in other respects, actually offering you know a platform via Zoom um, is it shows you're you're taking it seriously. You're doing you're not just it's not the the same old uh, phone call to the vet service. This is oh this is a bit different, and I'm being given a specific time and a specific link, and that's my opportunity one to one with with the clinician. Um, so you know selling it in those ways as well and um, I, I know that some practices are putting really good sort of informational little videos on their websites as well explaining new processes so maybe that also is another way you can sort of uh, uh, explain it to to your clients and also use that as a, an, an avenue to explain before your consultation, these are some things you can do to prepare. Um, maybe, you know, have a think about what, um, you know, what are you particularly worried about today, but your vet's probably going to ask about appetite, thirst, activity levels or whatever, you know, give them some, uh, almost some homework to think about before the appointment as well. And then it perhaps will feel more of a, you know, a, of a, uh, a very definite service to them if of course I don't need persuading that it's you're offering a service but from their perspective if they feel oh gosh yes this is a bit more of an undertaking perhaps that also helps to reinforce the message that you know this is um, this is this is not um, an insignificant offering this is a very you know yes. very real and helpful uh, initiative and very yeah very rounded and and just as just as um important really as one that you're doing face to face. Um, and another really good question here, Sarah, and you probably will will know the answer to this one, I would imagine, with, with your experience. But in terms of indemnity, um, does VDS and other um, indemnifiers, would they cover telemedicine in case you made a mistake or something like that? Mm, well, actually, well, I do, I, I do have VDS indemnity, indemnity cover, and I'm not sure I've ever specifically really um, probed that. To be absolutely honest with you, uh, I mean, I think as always, of course, um, it's really important to to keep good clinical records. And if you are making a prescription based on that phone discussion, then the Royal College um, guidelines do include that, you know, we need to be able to to justify why that is. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, as long as we have clear records that 
justify clinically our decisions, then even if something is it turns out to be very different, um, I I don't think that um, you know I I I think we we should be fine in terms of our uh, professional. Um, uh, standing, as it were, because uh, we can only go on on the information that that we receive, um, and of course, if you know the sorts of medications that we're likely to be prescribing um, are, you know, we're not going to be, um, I think, making um, a dramatic diagnosis that had uh, potentially, uh, I don't know. If it's side effects, uh, challenging treatment over telemedicine, that, that sort of decision is, is probably going to still require our direct examination of the patient. But um, I think, um, in, I, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm starting to waffle a bit here, as you can tell, but I think, uh, I think we should be fine. Um, but uh, if you, if you have got uh, definite concerns, then of course, I think that's, that's something to ask the VDS in terms of their position. I don't know whether they've made any statements uh, to support the profession since the COVID uh, situation appeared. Again, if anyone else has insight, share it with us please oh we have we have already <laughs> so Perfect. so someone has just posted um just in in response uh, to what you've just said sarah so vds have a series of very good webinars on video consults and they do cover them um but you as you have pointed out you do need to record your decision making process perfect thank you very much well, you <laughs> <laughs> me. thank you and thank you to, to um, Sarah who sent in that answer as well. Another Sarah um, who's watching online. Um, and uh, Sarah, another question came in about um, uh, carrying out, I suppose, telephone consultations versus video consultations and how reliable is a, an owner's description um, of, of the pet's condition without having those visual cues. So if you, if you didn't have any photographs or you didn't have a, you know, a camera or anything to look at, in your experience, can they reliably describe what's happening over the telephone? Yes, I think, I mean, the honest answer to that is that it, it's going to vary a lot um, according to the situation and probably the owner and their their potential experience, for example, you know, an owner that's managed a diabetic cat before or has been looking after their diabetic cat for several years um, and perhaps has had complications in the past, you might feel you can really um, trust uh, very highly what they're reporting because they've had that experience and they've been on a learning curve with you. Um, whereas for other situations that, that clearly won't apply. And um, in fact, a, a friend and vet colleague of mine I was talking to a couple of days ago and, and telling them that I was I was giving this webinar, and, you know, asking for some, you know, tips and experience, um, said she'd had one situation where an owner was talking about a mass, a lump they could feel. Um, I think it was on, under a collar and there was sort of, um, she was trying to work her out over the phone and with them video what exactly this lump was and was it a, um, I think a bursitis or a cyst with some of the, the sort of differential diagnoses, but really impossible to say. And I think at that point the, the dog was all right but then subsequently it developed other health complications and and I think started to vomit it ended up coming into the clinic mm -hmm. and um, and anyway this lump that had been the original reason for their phone call was just some matted fur so <laughs> it was not of anything of any clinical consequence um, and yeah so it, I think it you just of course again have to try and use your clinical judgment to try and determine um, and um, you know we, we've only reminded ourselves as well I think that it's only relatively recently that the video option has existed for years and years and years out of hours phone calls etc we've triaged primarily just with phone data and we know it's not perfect but we just have to I, I think use all of our clinical antennae to try and um, reassure ourselves as to how urgent or otherwise the patient might be and be able to justify those decisions and know that it's not a perfect scenario that we're in but um, uh, I, th I think the, the video aspect of the consultation 
can be helpful, but it's not always as helpful as we would like. Um, similarly, the owner reported history, as we know, some owners, you know, are brilliant at um, focusing on the key information and it's really easy to, um, to, to uh, at the end of that conversation with them to have a really clear picture of what's going on versus other owners where you know we get a very shambolic sort of history and it's really difficult to work out um, and we just have to have to try and reconcile that somehow so I, I think just don't be too hard on yourself, I would say as well, that you, you can only do what you can do and try your very best. And um, so don't worry if the video bit is not available um, and trust your instincts. And, and always, I would say, tr get the, the clients to trust their instincts as well in terms of if concerned over more urgent things, if they really feel really worried, then I would always take that seriously, um, even in the, the current scenario, try and facilitate the, the urgent support that of course might be needed for some of these cases. Yes, they know they know their pets so well, don't they? So yeah, okay. And someone actually um further elucidation around uh, the VDS um point was that um during the VDS webinar on this topic, uh, they they made very clear that we as vets still remain responsible for the owner's safety when requesting that the owner examine their pet. So maybe if you're asking them to, you know, um, manipulate their animal or lift a lip or something like that is still our responsibility. We're still responsible for, for owner safety. That's a very good point, yes. And and I think um, any clinical data that we potentially suggest is collected, we, we of course need to accept that it, 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 it might not be possible for all sorts of reasons and uh, that you know we should not feel bad and our owners should not feel bad if it's just not possible to collect it and, and yes I would agree obviously our human safety is, is really vital to um, include in our calculations. Great stuff. Um, I've got, um, we've probably got time for just maybe one or two more questions, but um, I've got a question here about operating systems of computers and stuff. I don't know if um, if, uh, if you guys would be familiar with this, but just asking about setup procedures um, with operating systems that aren't Windows 10, maybe Hannah, in respect of the MSD system, do you know someone's using a Mint, a Mint Bunto? system as they're operating? Um, Sarah, Sarah, I think you've you've got some uh, experience of this, haven't you? You, We were talking about this earlier. We were talking about this earlier, yes. I think not so much directly related to particular operating systems, but yes, we, we were talking about the, the fact that in some clinics the, the computer system is quite limited uh, in terms of your ability to launch browsers and go online or download applications um, but again I think you know my top tip would be really that the verbal communication gets you a very long way through what is needed and and whilst the the video element can be helpful no doubt um, it's it it is actually the audio in terms of discussion with the owner that, uh, in my opinion, provides you with the, the the vast majority of clinically useful information. So I would say, you know, don't panic about that. Um, potentially what you can consider, obviously, with your practice support would be to use your own mobile phone if you have WhatsApp and the client has WhatsApp or Zoom on your phone. So if you feel a video element to the consultation really is going to help make a big difference um, then maybe you you know you, you step off the practice system to, to do the consultation if that's something that your your clinic are happy um, for you to do so um, but if, if not I mean really as long as you've got some ability to, to communicate via audio I think you you've you get a long way there and then also that's the situation where uh, lastly if there is you know a, a lesion or you know a limp or whatever it might be where the owner can either photo and or video that and get that information to you then that can be an additional resource and that can help fill some of the gaps that you might feel you have if you can't have you know your your consulting room computer log into zoom or or the um, msd system for example yeah, exactly. and the MSD and the MSD system is a is a Zoom based platform. Um, mm -hmm. So you will, so the client will get their unique um, login link. 
So there's no need, obviously, to share personal phone numbers or email addresses or things like that. Um, so again, yes, just going back to what Sarah was saying, it may be that you know you're looking at using a platform that allow or a system that allows you onto the Zoom platform. So be that a practice iPad or something that might actually be a you know step away from your actual consulting room screen. Mm -hmm. And, and takes care of any problems with GDPR or, or capture or anything like that. So, excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. I think the only no, other thing I was going to say, sorry, uh, Libby, to interrupt you there, <laughs> just if you are, if you're using your own phone, um, that it's really quite hard for, for you to, um, well, you, you might want, um, I haven't got a sort of stand to put my phone in, but you might, that sort of thing might be helpful in terms of facilitating you to be able to look at the screen yourself um, and take notes, because otherwise, if you're trying to hold your phone and take notes, that's, that's quite tricky. <laughs> Um, and uh, I haven't got a stand for my phone and whenever I lean it against things it falls over and that's of course not very professional as well so that would be the only other things to maybe think of before you you embark down using your your personal phone is to think oh how can I uh, blue tack my phone to um, something so that it stays uh, still and allows me to uh, have eye contact in a nice way and still you know take notes and and uh, think about those things before you have a you know slightly topsy-turvy um, um, uh, discussion uh, with the client. Great stuff and, I, and I'm guessing in terms of kind of health and well-being as well I know that so many of us these days are kind of on our, our, our laptops and you know phones for long periods of time zooming with friends and everything else but you know to get up move around in between have a stretch so we're not kind of in fixed positions all the time as well um, especially if we're going to be doing more and more of these of these on, online uh, consultations. That's really a good point Libby and actually something that I didn't mention during the, um, the webinar was that some of the feedback of, um, around how to run those consultations quite often they're actually very effective if you're doing a, a web-based um, meeting or clinic is to actually be stood up because mm -hmm. going back to eye contact body language movement um, is such a key part of getting your message across so either standing up and not crazily moving around but it's a more sort of natural posture and if you are sitting down to not be afraid to use you know hand gestures and things like that because it does add that um, um, level of um, tone into your voice rather than just being very sort of flat and monotone so standing up moving around is uh, is not only good for your health and well-being but it actually can deliver your message more effectively. Fantastic. Some great tips there. Thank you, Hannah. Well, I think we've we've come to an end really of this evening. So we've we've um, got through all our questions. We've got lots of thanks coming in actually, and and someone has mentioned that um, they want to they thought the dual presentation worked really well, and especially with two different skill sets and approaches as well. So, I'm um, very much appreciated. So, and I think I would echo that really from from all of us, um, to you, Sarah, and to Hannah. It's been terrific. It's been uh, really really helpful insights and tips and um, and of course is is recorded so that we can listen back through it again and pick up even more oh, thank um, you so I'm going to sign off now. There is a CPD cert available. A few people have asked about that and we will send that out along with a link to the recording as well. So um, I'll start to wrap up then and just say thank you again to both our speakers, to Sarah and Hannah, and I hope you have a nice evening and I hope everybody else enjoys the rest of their evening and stays safe and well. Thanks everybody. Good evening.